Right, let's start and say, what is this all about? First of all, it's not a lecture. Somebody said, when does the lecture begin? I don't know, because there isn't going to be one. It's a discussion group. And what's it going to be about? It's going to be a little bit about my observations of the history of the JSE, the history of Ian Cruikshanks' tra trading in the JSE, in, not only in the JSE, but all the financial markets, whether it's bonds, equities, derivatives, or whatever. So uh, I've had a bit of experience, and hopefully uh, some of that may, may prove to be useful. A couple of things I'd like to say. You guys are here uh, all with your computer set up. Why? Because you're technical analysts, basically. And you are going to try and beat the systems. Remember what you're up against, and this is considerable. Nowadays, uh, you have computer set, computerized setup right close to the, to, to, to the fountain of all of the data which is coming out so that they can react faster than anyone can. Also, they've got a hell of a lot of power, more than any individual can mount up. So you can't move without logic. That's why I think it's very important. Don't just say, we've got a system and it works. If there was a system that was foolproof, Nobody else would ever hear about it because that founder of that system would sit at home, exercise his system, place the orders, and get incredibly wealthy. How many books have you seen which said, here is a guaranteed method of accumulating a fortune in te with technical analysis? Why do they write the books? <laughs> because they need the revenue. That's it, and that's it. So we've got to look at uh, a combination. I think a sensible view is a combination of fundamental and technical analysis. Why should that pay off? Well, the richest investor in the world, Warren Buffett. How rich? Over $50 billion worth that we know of. That's a heck of a lot. How has he got it? So I've done a little bit of analysis, and I think we mostly know that. He's investigated companies where he sees them selling as an essential service. He's been a backer of Coca-Cola forever. You say, essential service in the American consumer world, that's, a, that's an essential product. That is it. And he gets to know the management. He gets to know their strategies. He gets to know whether he can trust them, whether they've got responsibility, and how they're ex exercising this in their way ahead. Studying every aspect of the company, whether it's providing an essential service or product and where it's going to be on an ongoing basis and that he can trust the management and that they're updating themselves with changes in management strategy and changes in the environment. What's the environment? The state of the economy at any particular time. So, you know, bear that in mind. If he made that much, you're not going to compete very easily with that unless you're using some of what he has done. That's available. You can get it through your system. You can eat. It's always, it's always get edible. It's just a question of doing the research, doing the homework. And I think that, uh, whereas you'll say we're technical analysts, I would say do the fundamental analysis, but don't put an order on until you've checked the chart, until you've looked at it from a technical point of view. Those two together, I think, uh, give one a good possibility. Then, you know, you see a lot of comments on the markets. It went up and it went down. Why did it go up? More buyers and sellers. Why did it go down? More sellers and buyers. It's a hell of a lot more than that. You know, you've got to say, listen, this data came out. And somebody said, this is going to impact this sector of the economy, this industry, and that company in that industry is likely to do better. That's very important. And I think, uh, you know, if you see uh, credit data comes out and suddenly it starts to run up, you say, oh, there's more consumer spending. Yeah, but the credit is higher because people can't afford to buy for cash, therefore think ahead. Do some lateral analysis. Maybe the, the companies are going to find that those selling for cash will sell less because there are fewer cash customers. That means volumes will come down. Consider these factors and try and bring them in. Do your lateral analysis, burl it up into the total decision and say, right, what are we going to do? Um, it's a question of looking at, at, at all, at all uh, possibilities. And then remember, there's one factor that you can't ignore, and it's a fact of life, a sad fact of life, insider trading. There's always somebody who knows the numbers before the public. The accountant, the auditors, whoever, they know those numbers and not always, but frequently, or sometimes, let's say. There is a trading on that inside knowledge, and that is when you'll see a, a share price which has been within a range of whatever it is, 20 to 21, and all of a sudden, pops, pops out. You say, hell, there's no reason for it. And then it pops out again. If that happens, 
go and say, is there somebody who knows more than the public? Let's go and look, but try and find a fundamental reason for that little pop-up out of a range or out above or below a, a, a trend line before taking any action. You know, investigate the situation first, and I think that that is it. Um, also, don't move just because somebody says, what if this happened or what if that happened? That's not, a, that's not a fact. The probability of that what-if policy coming about are unlikely. If you think there's reason behind that what-if uh, suggestion, investigate it before you act on it. Always do treat with a lot of circumspection those people who say, I have inside knowledge, or here's a hot tip. Doesn't usually work, I think. All right, so let's look at this environment where we're basically looking now, I think, at the stocks, at the JSE, derivatives of shares, and say, uh, what is the history of that? Just out of interest, interest sake, JSE started over 100 years ago. You know where it started. I asked the question just now, nobody seemed to know. It started in a street in central Johannesburg. And uh, what did they do? They roped off the end of the block and said, trading between here and here, we are going to start trading in basically gold mines all those times ago, uh, because that was the foundation of the whole of Vardasaran, the economy of South Africa. And uh, how did they say, well, you can't have people walking in and out of the market, but they had some boards along the side, and every day they'd pull a chain across the end of the road, across the end of the road, on either side. And so the JSC trading area got known as between the chains. And they kept at it too. Uh, I remember in the Stock Exchange in Hollard Street, which was before the one in Diagonal Street, which was before the one in, uh, in Santon, um, they had a picture of a chain across the floor. Unless you were within that boundary, your, your transaction could be claimed as invalid. So just a little bit of history, not necessarily useful, but it is interesting to see where does it come from. What's the primary function of the Stock Exchange? To trade in shares? No, to raise capital. That is what really counts. Because how do we get capital? We say, hey, look at the value of this company. We issued so many shares at a price. Now other people are buying them at that price plus a whole lot more. That's attractive, isn't it? Yes. Now if we want to do the same again, how do we do it? We sell more of those shares. How do we do that? Because we've established a value level. That's what the, that's what the, the, the share price does. Okay, a little bit of history. Uh, when we started, uh, when, when I started, it was a long time ago. But anyway, that doesn't have to be included. But anyway, okay. Uh, when, we, when, they, when, when they started, it was you had what you called floor traders. Only a certain number of people were able to trade. They had to pass a little test and whatever to prove that they had some knowledge of the companies in which, uh, in which they were trading. And really, it was you had a pad of orders. Nothing was computerized. And you'd try and meet somebody else who was shouting out, De Beers, De Beers, what do you want to do? I want to buy, I want to sell. And so they got together and said, right, here's a piece of paper. I've sold you so many, or I bought so many from you. It's gone a long way from them. And I think uh, there's a lot more responsibility as to that. In those days, it was very important to have stamina because you had to stand on the floor all day, every day. And it could get quite competitive. And you've probably seen those old movies of people shouting, whatever, and getting kicked in the shin and whatever. But, but you know, it, it, it has changed a lot. It was a lot of fun in those days too. But you'll say a funny, funny definition of fun. But nevertheless, you learned to have, uh, you had to have a lot of, 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 uh, of physical attributes. You had to have stamina because you were standing and shouting whatever all day. And... Uh, how do I know? I was a survivor. I was on that floor. But remember, there's a lot of things which go into making a complete trader. In those days, you had to have stamina. Well, I was a runner, and uh, to prove it that I had stamina, I had 10 comrades. This is a personal thing. And, you know, it just was one of those things. Don't, it, don't think that the mind drives at all. Yes, it may drive it. You have a healthy body, you have promote a healthy mind. A little bit of a personal outlook there. Um, it's like combining technical and fundamental analysis. Really, uh, I, I think there are so many people who say, the price goes up, the price goes down. That's what I call elevator analysis. That's not analysis. That's just a comment. That's just reporting what went on. You can read it in the newspaper. That's not enough. Try to absorb the fact that you've got to say, look at what drove this up and down and look at what the fallout is going to be, what's it mean to us? What's us? 
your trading platforms. What's it going to mean to the value of the stocks that you're trading in? I think that that is important. So it's a combined approach that we have to do. Look for winning companies. I think it's not just the share price goes up and down. It's is there a justification for being at that level in any case? Look for winning companies. What do they do? Go back to Warren Buffett. Uh, look for a company that sells a product or a service which is so attractive that consumers want to buy it. You say, is that all? Hey, that's a major thing. You know I mean, how, much, how much stuff, how many products, how many services are produced and never get sold because those were poor ideas and they're not going to be commercial. So that's important, you know. Uh, then just look at those companies that have a sustainable competitive advantage. Can they sustain it? Well, Coca-Cola never shared the recipe for the Coca-Cola uh, brand and maybe that is why they've had a sustainable advantage. Nobody else, you know, in that industry has made as much money as they have till they invented beer and SA breweries came along, of course. But that was a different story. Then look for strong, competent management teams where you can understand the strategy and it seems to be a sustainable one. I think that that's very important and I think that way uh, you're going to be able to expand your own limits, broaden your own horizons and be able to, to take the, from the information that's available all that is necessary to have your own trading, uh, trading uh, uh, philosophy. Um, when it comes actually to trading, uh, I think it's important to say uh, remember that you're here to make short-term profits. Clearly, I don't see that personally as a primary aim of investing. Remember the difference between investing and trading. It's like buying a gold share. Is that an investment? Not really. Gold, sh gold shares are more uh, trading uh, mediums than short-term trading mediums than long-term assets. Why? Because it's got a declining value and it's in what we can only call as a sunset industry. Um, let's look at what we aim for. Aim for 100%. Are you going to make it? Well, maybe occasionally. I got 100% once, you know. So, so I know it's attainable. Where did I get it? In maths in grade 10. I never did it again. <laughs> but, and when I came to stats and finance, it was more challenging. But, you know, it didn't stop me from aiming at 100%. Go for it. 30% is a pass mark in matric. Nonsense. That's a fail. They've, they've, they, they, they've plugged 50% of the questions. You know, that's not what we accept as being good enough. It is not good enough. We must aim at 100%. Are you going to hit it? Well, look, aim at straight A's. That's good enough. That, that's pretty darn good. And, you know, as, as an attitude, not just as long as we pass, it's okay. That's not okay. Uh, the other thing is, how much effort do you put into it? Well, I'll try as hard as I can. No, you try putting in 100%. All the time. That's, that's really important. And you've got to keep at it. You've got to dream stocks. My wife sometimes used to say to me when I was a, an own account trader, she'd say, phew, you must have a bigger uh, a position in the market. How do you know? He said, God, you spent the whole day kicking it up or the whole night picking, kicking it up or kicking it down. So you live it. That's okay. You know, that's what you're deciding to do if you're a trader in this sort of respect. And I think you've got to keep on at that sort of degree of effort all the time every time. Um, what else can we say? Well, if we have a look at, uh, uh, at, at the performance of professional asset managers, you'd like to get there in due course. Sure, you'd like to accumulate your own fortune, but what's the big aim? Surely, to manage funds, big funds, so that when they say, uh, hey, Mr. A is coming in, he, we know we've got to follow him because he's got a great record. How do you build that up? Well, interestingly enough, the majority, less than 50% of professional asset managers in the funds that they manage beat the, all, beat the performance of the all share index. Say, so, gee, is that good? That's the situation if you're a big fund manager, what you have to do. Uh, it just says that, you know, how difficult is it to, to beat the average? Very difficult indeed. And I think one has to bear that in mind. Um, I'm not quite sure whatever else I can tell you. Check all details. Be observant. Look around you. When you came in to the, where we, the reception area, did anybody see those six clocks al along the, the top of the desk? Mm -hmm. And I can, you did. And uh, did you notice that the, com the, the countries that they were from were Johannesburg and, uh, and Germany, 
Well, I'll tell you why I single those out. Uh, there's New York, London, Tokyo, Sydney. Why was it interesting to look at Johannesburg and Berlin? Well, the one said 20 to 10, and the other said 9.30. We were on the same timeline. And I looked at that and say, these guys are not good at detail. Okay, now you say, gee, does it matter? Go use that lateral vision all the time. Keep your eyes open for what other people didn't notice. Nobody else here saw that there were two sets of time. Now, should I look at Joburg time or Berlin time? One of them may be right. One of them does not have to be right. It could be somewhere in between. So don't take what people say for granted. Do your fundamental analysis. Check what your uh, technical analysis says and put it together. That way, at least you've got a leading chance. That's a good start. Okay, I said to start off with, this wasn't a lecture. It's a little bit of history, a little bit of a personal history. This is a discussion group. Okay, open the floor for discussion. There's more work in research. There's more work in looking at what you're going to do than actually doing what you're going to do. No. So the only issue that I've encountered is that when I'm, when I'm busy trading, sometimes I have a small little impulse and then I want to buy a particular company because I'm looking at its, maybe it's its volumes, <coughs> at the volume of the asking and so I buy that particular company. But now I've seen that, is it a bad habit to do that or in every decision that you make, do you really have to put all, all of that work in? Whose funds are you trading with? I'm trading Yours. with mine, yes. Would you rather not be sure than just say, well maybe it'll be good or bad or whatever. My view is it's always worth doing a little investigation. Um, you may find over time that you have a gut feel that you can learn to trust, or you have learned to trust. But uh, to, I think in the longer term, nothing beats being sure of, hey, here's everything I can find to influence this decision. And so I'm expecting a 20% move, and it's moved 2% already. You haven't lost 2%, you're more sure of getting the other 18%. And I think that that possibly is a way to consider it increase your, 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 your profit potential. Look, there are many people who claim to make money out of very short-term variations, purely just looking by small, small signals. And yes, uh, that's okay, but I don't, think it's, it's, I don't think that that is exercising maximum potential. But there are, there are many different ways of, uh, of discerning uh, how, what sort of action one should have in the market. Mine can't necessarily be right all the time, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Apart from the fact that I really appreciate discussing it with yourselves. That's, that is important. Just one more. Okay, I understand the psychology of your generation. The oh, industrial he doesn't guys. want to be rude, but... <laughs> <laughs> the industrial guys, you know. But our generation, okay, we are... We, we want to cut the middle man out. Yes. You see, and I know your generation, because I've worked with a lot of people like you, they work hard. Sure. They work hard, like they put in the work. Yeah. Our generation, we've got a Facebook, uh, we've got a Facebook CEO, youngest CEO, I mean, youngest billionaire in the world, doesn't even have a thousand employees. Yes. You see, that's the difference between our generation and yours. <laughs> you see, so now I just want to find out from your view, and putting aside the psychology of an industrial age, is there a way to cut the middleman out, to cut out the extra work? You know, that's hard to say. Yes, if you're a good inventor, if you can think ahead of the majority, if you can say, if I say to you, what's 19 times 19? You plug it into your computer. And I say to you, I don't know my 19 times table but I know that it's 361. You can check it. How did I do that? Shortcuts. Now, it's, it's something that I meant to, to bring up. 19 times 2 is 38. Therefore, times 20, it must be 380. 19 times 20 is one less than 20. So, so therefore, I take 380, that's 19, it's 361. So you can win. You can cut out the need for a computer if you can find the shortcuts. Yes, it can be done. And that is the basis of a potential fortune. But, you know, to look for that, be alert, 
to unexpected not uh, yes, opportunities. And how can you say, take this, and instead of doing all of that, cut across there? Yes, be looking for that all the time. But those, are, those, those factors don't all uh, uh, pitch up. Somebody may t test me in my 27 times table, and that gets a little more trying. <laughs> no, but, but seriously, th this, is a, this is a sort of thing to do. Very often, one can take a jump ahead because the majority haven't thought of the method. I don't know if that helps, but... Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, I know you say there's fundamental, there's technical, there's economic research we need to be looking at, but like in the past two weeks alone, what happens when one day you just have a huge run, then on economic data, the next day a huge fall, yeah. and then it's and then the next day it's a huge run, a huge fall. Sometimes it's just it's so random, and there's no new data, and you just sit there wondering why. Uh, okay, I think a large part of it has to do with. Uh, the volatility in the liquidity in the market. Something has been said or has happened that has made the, the international investors take a step back and say, actually, I was going to put on to buy some RSA bonds, but now I'm not going to, or I'm going to sell. You don't see it until the next day. You only see the next day that there have been big sellers of RSA bonds. What has that done? What has that done? That's taken cash, taken investment funds, uh, portfolio flows out of the system and the market comes back. The bond rates go up, bond prices go down and it impacts all the way down into the equities and all other markets too. So there is a sequence, just got to look at it. Don't forget to check every day in that case, uh, which seeing we're being run by concerns about liquidity, what the foreign portfolio flows are. How can you see it? JSC publishes the information on a daily basis. Yes, you may only get it the next day, but you can get it overnight. And I think that that gives you a step ahead. Don't wait to be told, you know. Go and look for the source of it. I, I, I think that that is it. There's always a reason. In the case of macro data, macroeconomic data, there isn't an insider trading, that, uh, an insider trader. But uh, there are always people who are saying, what has changed since the last time we looked at it? One has to do that all the time. There's one, one yeah. other thing I've never understood. Pre-trading, pre the bank trading, why are banks allowed to trade for half an hour before we can? You know, like you can actually start in the markets. Yes. So the close and the open can be very different because the banks have that pre-auction. Yeah. Like what is that? Um, I, sorry, I, I can't comment on the JSE rules. That's uh, not that I can't say right or wrong, but it's something that I have to, have to check on. Is an honest answer. Um, I, I think it is to try and set a, a foundation for market makers. Because if you then want to say, I want to buy 10 million rands of company A, then you must at least know that those who are making the position, making the market, to say, I'll sell them to you, whether they have them or not, know approximately what the, the buy and sell, the, the, what the purchase, potential purchase and sale dynamics are. That may not be quite satisfactory, and I understand that, but I, th I think that that is the foundation of it. Market makers may not be trading, as you just asked, they may simply be establishing their positions so that they're ready to take on what the market wants to do. Oh, the thing is, um, you know you, you have actual data that uh, is, is announced in, a, in the market on yeah. any day. But then something that I just don't understand is that what the market expects and what actually the data is. I mean, you, we all know that uh, the market reacts to uh, data, I mean, like uh, numbers that they, yeah. they, 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 they didn't expect. I mean, if, if they say, okay, inflation is going to be uh, 5.9, and then it happens that it, be, it becomes uh, Six, uh, six percent above or below. That's when we react. But then, if it's just five point nine, we don't react to that. But um, I just checked recently now that even though we knew that um, the federal uh, open um, the federal open, open market open, committee open, yeah. open market committee meeting, they had the meeting and the minutes from that. We all expected that they're going to ease down on quantitative easing, but. Uh, the day after, I mean, the, the day after the, the minutes were, were, were published, we still reacted to that as if, oh, we didn't know that they, they, they're going to ease down on. Okay, let me just deal with that right now. 
because the majority didn't say, what did he say last time? What did he say? He said two things. It's going to be, the decision will be data dependent. Those were his words. You must check on every word. What does that mean? It means if there's any change in the data, that'll impact. The other thing is, uh, and the labor and the health of the labor market. He didn't say unemployment at that. He said the health of the labor market. So go and have a look then what's changed since the last meeting. Just have a look at it. Data, what's happened? The rate of growth in, the US, in, in US GDP has actually slowed a little. And uh, uh, does that matter to the world? I'm darn sure it does. Uh, US GDP makes up 21% of world GDP. So nothing happens without them. Oh, what about China? China's uh, about 9% of global GDP. That puts it in a relative position. Okay, it's growing faster, but nevertheless this big monolithic economy of the US is actually growing, only at 2% perhaps, but as that moves ahead, China's target to catch up and overtake is getting more and more difficult to attain. They could well attain it, but it's decades away. And I think that that is it. So you say, okay, but now the US is growing pretty slower, slowly. Earlier in the year, they were looking at 3% growth. They now downgraded that they are maybe only 2% or just over. So look at that as a difference. Has everybody, sorry, I know you want to speak, has everybody got there? And then you say, look at the health of the labor market. Uh, yes, it's marginally better. And what's interesting is the unemployment rate has come down. One of the reasons is that so many people have, uh, have given up looking for jobs because it's not a job producing sort of economy at the moment, not a job creating economy. And, uh, that, that there, and there are so many people who don't have the right education, the right qualifications, they say, we give up. Then they fall out of the statistics. And it looks like then the unemployment rate is lower than it really is in fact. The number of unemployed is still as high. You've got to look at all those sort of deals. That's a hell of a lot of work and sweat and toil. But check it, it's your capital that you're playing with, Make sure, not playing with, that you're working with. Make sure that you, know, you look at all these details. That's why they're important. The majority in the market don't do this. You know, and if you're dealing with your capital, or in fact, even more important, your client's capital, you've got to be well informed on that. Okay, because that's, that's part of your question. You're going to have another segment? Yeah. Um, and then in, in such an environment, I mean, it, it becomes a bit uh, complicated and difficult uh, sticking to your trading plan. I mean, do you then, do you then, um, knowing that okay such news will come and expect that okay these are what the numbers are going to be do i then prepare myself <coughs> uh, change my 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 my, my uh, trading strategy do i change it prior as in like before or do i change it after the news have uh, um, i now know, uh, have knowledge of um, what's sure or, or just go neutral stand back doing nothing isn't not taking a decision that can be a conscious decision where you say, Phew, I don't know what's coming at me next. Take a step back and watch it go, back for, go by for a little while and see how fast it's going by or whatever, what sort of volatility is being built into it or coming into it or building up and then take another decision. It's never too late to step back in because you can be a bull or bear or whatever. I, I think that that's, that's important. And you know, it's like, let's, let's do it in South African practical terms. I remember uh, at, at a monetary policy meeting, a monetary policy forum at the Reserve Bank some time ago. I happened to be, have the good fortune to, to, to speak to the, the governor on her own, just for a few minutes. And we were talking about the threats to monetary policy, the threats to inflation which governs it. And she was going, she says, the biggest threat to inflation is the rand exchange rate. The rand exchange rate was just over nine rand, nine rand fifty perhaps at that stage. Look where it is now. Her words were, the greatest threat to inflation is the rand exchange rate. So why should I have been concerned? Why should I have been surprised that inflation, which was forecast at 5.9 to 6%, came out at 6.3? I thought it could be 6.5, but it was going, you know, between six and a quarter and six and a half. A higher range, because I listened to the governor. She know, they, they have the best source of information. So take that into account. It's not insider trading, just listening and analyzing and trying to, to strategize on that.